This, this uh, guy is at this for bringing everyone singing these songs of Vekos, of closeness with Hashem. You guys getting, everyone's getting really into it. And this guy, if the song finishes, he says, I want to show with you guys something. He said, I was in a very dark place. I was making one mistake after another, going lower and lower. I didn't know about mistakes. I didn't know. He made lots of mistakes. It was a very dark place. I remembered that I was at another Fabringen on the 19th of Kislev, and, the, and the, the discussion was about the following. The discussion was about a candle of God is the soul of man. And the idea was that every single Jew has a candle inside of them. And the neshama is compared to this, is compared to a candle. And when I thought about this, it just, even before, like I remembered all the things, I remembered the whole content, the whole, the whole idea, just a thought that there's something inside of me that's good, that's pure, that's holy, that itself woke me out of where I was and gave me the impetus and the wherewithal to move further. There's a, a reason the Torah compares a soul to a candle. There are three reasons. Reason number one is that just like with a um, with a candle, you use the candle to um, to see in the dark, so too, how are you supposed to figure out what's going on inside of you? Everyone has dark parts and there's better parts. How do you know what's good and what isn't good inside of you? What, what part of you is supposed to look at in order to perfect everything? You have to look at you, use your candle. As the end of the verse is, the candle of gold, God is a soul of man that searches all the parts of the kishkas, our kishkas, our insides. You use your neshama to look inside. The, you could justify things, but then you could look at yourself from the perspective of your inner deepest voice, of your neshama's voice. Say, this is the way I want to be. Like, sometimes your neshama wakes up, right? Sometimes your neshama is, is vibrant and shining in you. And based upon your neshama's perspective, so then things which were okay yesterday, you, know, you realize, when you, know, when you know the way things are from your neshama's perspective, then you, you, you upgrade a different level. You, when you use your heart, you, I don't mean your, your innermost part of your heart, you use, you use your neshama to look at things, so then, then, you, then you're able to, to see things differently. Another reason the soul is compared to a candle is just like a candle goes upwards, so to the neshama always wants to be closer to Hashem. No matter what's going on, we think we have all different directions we want to go in our career, in our relationships, in our finances, in our health. But there's a part of us, the deepest part of us, and the most realest part of us, that wants to be closer to Hashem, wants to be closer now than it was yesterday. That's, 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 the, that's the most real part of us. The neshama wants to be closer. And just like the um, neshama is, um, just like fire, is, has no weight, unlike air, air has weight, but fire has no weight, fire is the lightest thing. So the soul is very, very spiritual. It's a very spiritual thing. And there's another fourth reason that the soul is compared to a candle, and this fourth reason is the focus I want to discuss tonight. The fourth reason is, is because just like when you light a candle from a candle, the original candle is not missing anything, so too, when it, one neshama lights up another neshama, when you light up another person's soul, it doesn't take away from you. Not only does it take it away, not only does not only does it not take away from you, but it actually fulfills the whole purpose of why you're here in the first place. The title of this week's Torah portion, Balizcha, means to be elevated, to go higher, to be to be the best. What makes you the best? What makes you elevated? What is the, what is the Torah talking about when it says be mm-hmm. elevated? It's talking about lighting the candles of the menorah. The candles of the menorah represent the souls, the souls of the Jewish people. What makes your soul higher? when you light up someone else's soul. That's the purpose of why your soul is here. And it's people who are here tonight looking at each other. When you light up another Jew, you don't have to go too far away. One person, a second person, are right around you. And you light up their neshama, that gives you, that gives you your perfection of why your soul is here. That's you fulfilling the reason why you were born. And together, you know, each person, like another neshama, it creates a whole... More and more light creates a, a, a big torch of light that, that uh, brings Mashiach. So, 
the Torah says that Aaron was the one who lit the menorah, practically. He was the one who did it. However, it didn't have to be Aaron. It could have been any Tom, Dick, and Harry could light the menorah. It didn't have to be Aaron. Anyone could light the menorah. What does that tell us? That every one of us is empowered by Hashem to inspire another person. That I told a friend of mine again, every soul in our generation is here to inspire, to be close to another Jew. Why is my, here, my soul here? It's here for you. So everyone, even if not Aaron Akon, if you're not a super soul, you're here in order to inspire another person. However, that's only, it's interesting, that's the, regarding the lighting of the menorah. However, the preparation for the lighting of the menorah, mm-hmm. the removal of the old wicks and the old oil, and putting the new wicks and the new oil, that need a coin. I was talking to a cousin of mine, distant cousin, he's not religious, it's Hanukkah time, and I had this very um, profound message I was going to give him, and I gave to him. And I gave it to him so eloquently, with a full arrogance that I had at the time, which unfortunately is only expanded. Anyway, so, so, so uh, I, said, I said to him this, this brilliant idea, and after sharing this brilliant idea that I had, which was so inspiring and so meaningful, I was just going to instantaneously transform his life forever, um, I also had a menorah. I was in New York, I was living in New York at the time, I had a menorah, and I gave him the menorah. And I saw him like a month later, and he said to me, you know, you know what really touched me when I spoke to you? You gave me that menorah. You know what I did? I lit the menorah. That was unbelievable. It was so, so, it did so much for me like the menorah. It was such an amazing thing. So I realized, like, I have all these things that I think are inspiring. Then there is the Rebbe. The Rebbe is a Kohen Godel. The Rebbe is the iron of our generation. And the Rebbe says that there are 10 Mitzvah campaigns. And these are the campaigns you need to reach out to other Jews and inspire them. Lighting Shabbos candles, uh, uh, the Mitzvah of Kosher, the Mitzvah of Education, the mitzvah of Abbas Yisrael, the mitzvah of study of Torah, that every Jew should have Torah books in their home, to fill in, uh, everyone, should have a mezu- everyone should have mezuzah in their, every door of their home. And on Hanukkah, make sure every Jew lights a menorah. The, these, these, family purity, these mitzvahs are, are what the Kohen Gadol gives us, prepares for us to light up other souls. Yes, you have to go and light up another person's soul. But what are you supposed to use the light of the other person's soul? Use what the Kohen God has prepared. You can't know how to light up another person's soul. You can't know. Well, let me let me let me add a caveat to that. Everyone, there's 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 three parts to being able to light up someone's soul. There's three parts to it. The first part of it is you have to believe in your own candle. You have to actually believe 100 percent and listen to your inner voice that you know is true, and let it talk to you. Let yourself believe the MS, the truth that you have in the Shama, and your Shama is a candle, and it's pure, and it's innocent, and it's good, and it's holy, and it's special. And in language of Rabbi Reber, hug yourself, look in the mirror, and, and, it says, and say how wonderful you are. Light the candle. Light the candle. Number two, you have to also believe that, that the other Jew has also a candle. But you can't believe in their candle unless you believe in your own candle. Believe in your candle, believe in the other person's candle. Step number three, step number three is a tricky part. Because step number three affects one and two also. Step number three is, you don't see the other person's candle, but you believe it's there. You believe the person has a candle, you believe, yes, you believe. But you have to find a wick. You have to find a way to reach them. You have to find the exact way to reach them. You have to find a way and, and you have to stay there. And it could be the first time you tried, and the second time you tried, and it's the third time. Because it could be the, wick, the, the, the match is wet, the wick is wet. Amen. There was a guy who um, committed, or he... The Rebbe asked him to commit to Panam Tefillin every day. And so he told the Rebbe, you know, it's hard for me to commit to Panam Tefillin every day because I don't like doing long-term commitments, right? So the Rebbe said, well, actually, it's not a long-term commitment because it's only commitment for, I don't know the exact words, but you're, you're off. You're off on Shabbos. You're off on Yantif. And you know what? For that person, that's what he needed to hear. He needed to hear a way that he could connect to it. He had this quirky thing, then like a long-term commitment, and that was what he needed to hear. 
Oh, it's not. It's not really long term. It's it's only for six days, and then every seven days you're you're off. Oh, okay, I, I can handle that. Is a six days? Is a day? Is a day off? Yeah, yes, they are. We're all quirky. We're all quirky, and we all have our things that we do and things we don't want to do. And the thing is, if the if to the stay there with your with your with your uh, fire, whether it's cold, it's freezing, you don't see the point of it, and you keep on keep on. There's always there's always a way to reach someone. I was reading a letter to the Rebbe yesterday. To this guy who was trying to bring back together a husband and wife, apparently they got in some argument, and this guy was trying to, to bring them back together. And Deb tells him it's very it's, it's a very worthwhile endeavor. It's worthwhile because the Torah talks about uh, how great peace is. But then Deb said, every person there's a way to reach every person. If you, if they think about the guy was asking like for rules, how do I reach them? He said every person is reachable. You have to think about who that person is. And you have to think about this, this situation and the characteristics of this person and the life that they're living. And based upon where they are, you have to, that, that's how you have to give them the message of the Kohen. But don't change the message. The message is the message of the Kohen. Don't, th- th- there's a thing that says about Aaron. He loved creatures and brought them close to the Torah. He loved everybody, and he didn't bring the Torah to them. He brought them close to the Torah. It's a difference. Like, there was once, in time of the previous Rebbe, there were a group of well-meaning Jews who had this great idea about outreach. Previous Rebbe was encouraging reaching out to other people. And this guy, told, I don't know exactly what they said, but they had some kind of non-kosher method of reaching out to Jews. I know if it was like a dance party or something, something to bring Jewish boys and girls together. That's what I'm, I'm, I'm guessing. Rebbe, this is a good idea. And, and although you're religious, you might not like it. Mm-hmm. But the reason why this is a good idea is because there's a fire burning. When there's a fire burning, does it really matter if the water you're using is dirty? The wa- fire burning. Does not matter? The water is dirty. The water, the water is, they acknowledge, the water is dirty. It's not, it's not the most purest idea, but it's, it's, isn't, it, isn't, it, isn't there a fire burning? So the previous ever responded, it's correct that you're allowed to, light, to put out a fire with dirty water. What if instead of putting out the fire with water, you, try, you take gasoline instead? It's not, gonna, it's not going to put out the fire. In other words, young, young people are looking for the truth. They're looking, for, they're, they're looking for something higher than themselves. When you tell them the Torah can be adjusted, oh, you don't need to do this mitzvah right now, it's not, they don't, they don't want to hear that. They, they want to hear there's something higher than themselves, that there's, an, there's, there's an ambition, there's a truth, there's something of, above the, of the here and now, and it's real, and it can't be changed. That talks to, that talks to, to an idealistic person, that talks to, to the young person. So instead of bringing the Torah to them, it's not, which first of all is not going to work, because it's, 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 you're, you're showing them it's not really true, because it's adjustable, um, they don't need that. On the contrary, you're making, making it less appealing. So you have to, you have to think about the, the circumstances of the person that, that we're trying to light up and where they are and what, what talks to them and be patient and hold the wick there because it may be it's beneath the surface and you need to stay, go ahead. The language of the Rebbe to this guy, you want to bring the couple back together, you have to say it again and again, words come from the heart. Actually, the Rebbe said, interesting. The Rebbe said it's easy to talk from the heart to this couple because the effect of this decision will affect this couple and their children for generations. So therefore, when you're talking to them, it's easy to think about, it's easy to, to reach within your heart to talk to them because you, you know what kind of impact this may have. So the similar thing, when you're talking to a person about a mitzvah, you know what that is. It's, it's to realize it's, it's something really big. The Rebbe actually said once, before you speak to another Jew about Torah mitzvahs, you should first say a chapter of Tehillim and ask Hashem to help you talk from your heart. And one amazing thing that happens, I'll tell you a story. There was a Rabbi Gerari, Eingezund, from, from Buffalo. He was originally sent to Buffalo by the Rebbe. And it was Yom Kippur. And he was trying to make a minion. So it worked. He got a minion. But then he has finished davening from the and he looks around, and the minion is gone. <laughs> so, um, students, you know, frat houses, college campus... Buffalo, 60s, come on, Yom Kippur, Yom Kippur who, you know? So, so, uh, so he went, he went to um, try to get the minion back. He, he went and he went around and he got, he got nine Jews altogether. And he really wanted for Ne'ila to have a minion. Wow. The end of the conclusion of Yom Kippur. And he saw a Jewish looking face walking into a, uh, the cafeteria. And he's wearing his towel and his kittel and his gartel. <laughs> and he walks in there after, the, after this guy into the, in the cafeteria. 
And this, uh, he, this guy looks Jewish. He asks him if he's Jewish. He is Jewish. He says, you know what, today's Yom Kippur. Would you come help us with a minion? The boy is a good-natured American boy. He says, listen, I would help you, Rabbi, but I just got my favorite tonight. They don't have that every night, but they, tonight they have my favorite dinner, my favorite kind of, kind of meat, my favorite kind of thing. So I just need to finish dinner first, then I'll come. So Rabbi sits down, and he watches this guy <laughs> sitting, enjoying every morsel of his favorite dinner, and uh, the guy finishes eating, and then he walks over to Gerari for Ne'ila. It's already late. It's time to have Ne'ila. And he goes, and, and he's, you know, it's, 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 it's a little, um, not easy to be in Rabbi Gerari's shoes. Um, I think they've actually said to him, it was, it was to him, um, he was feeling bad about his situation, and we said to him, you should know I think the words were that the Rebbeim are with you. The altar of Mittler, the altar of are with you in your mission because you're literally saving lives. Anyways, so he, he, he comes to the end of the Ila, and then he literally says, Shema Yisrael, Hashem Elkein Hashem Echad, Baruch Shem Kuchil Kuchil Elim Vod, and Hashem Hu Elikim, Hashem Hu Elikim, Hashem, Hashem Hu Elikim. And here is this guy bawling, bawling. Who is bawling? This guy, the guy, the guy with the guy, the guy with the, uh, the ham and bacon, the ham and bacon guy is he's the one who's bawling. And he couldn't believe, like, what's this guy crying for? Why is he crying? This guy was really touched. And he actually was so touched that he made a dramatic move to go to Yeshiva in Hadara Torah, the Balchub Yeshiva Karnites. And he inspired many other Jews to come closer to Hermitsis. I know that all the boys in Yeshiva called him. Ne'ilah, they call him Ne'ilah. This was, this was the week. What would you call them if you, if you went to Gantan Ne'ilah? You would have called them, you know, Ham and Bacon. No, he's not, he's not Ham and Bacon, he's Ne'ilah. Ne'ilah is the name of every year. Every year is Ne'ilah. There was a woman, a, a widow. She wrote to the Rebbe that she's a widow. She, she was, either her husband was killed in the war, in one of the wars of Israel, or, she was kill, or he was killed in a terrorist attack, I don't remember. But... She was part of a group of, of, of widows from um, Tzahal, from the Israeli, Israeli Defense Force. And she wrote to Rebbe how lonely she is, how hard it is to be so lonely, not anybody around, and it's very difficult. What would you say to her? What could you say to her? It's lonely. It's lonely. Rebbe said to her this. We, we pray, we're going to say at the end of the year, help me, I shouldn't need the help of other people. Please, of human beings. I don't want to be helping human beings. The Rebbe said, if Hashem tells us to ask for this, that means we're each of each of you, the Rebbe said, and all your friends, the other widows, are all capable of achieving this. So you shouldn't need the help of other people. But how, you may ask, how can you have the power and the alacrity to overcome this, 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 this sense of loneliness? The Rebbe said, in every community, there are people who need help physical help, spiritual help, and you sh- and there are those who are, are who need help the most, but they're unable, to, they don't feel able, to, they're embarrassed to ask for help. And they're the ones who need the most help. And Nebuchadnezzar said, you should go and you should help those people in your, in your community, and you should give them the assistance they need, physical or spiritual, and that will solve your own, your own uh, sense of loneliness. That's what we told her. And it really, really, really touched her. It really transformed her life. Today I gave somebody a hug, and he told me, he said, I know you needed the hug more than me. It's like, yeah, it's true. I didn't need the hug more than him. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but, uh, but the only way to get a hug is to give a hug sometimes. And that's also, the same as also with, with lighting it on the neshama. In order for me to see the neshama in you, what part of me sees soul? What part of me sees soul? What part of me can see your soul? My mind can see your soul. My, my hands can see your soul. My feet can see your soul. Only my soul can see your soul. So it's an automatic thing. When you look for the good in another person, when you look for the soul of another person, you know what's happening to you? Automatically. Automatically. There's a metamorphosis. Automatically you have changed from caterpillar to butterfly just by you looking for soul of another person. You don't have to you didn't, you didn't do something else. Just because you're looking for soul of another person, you're automatically talking from soul in yourself. So is speaking, so is looking in you to find this whole other person. This will give, give us a great understanding of a story in this Torah portion. Yeshua notices a big problem. What's a problem? Problems like this. 
Hashem said there should be there should be seventy elders, right? Seventy elders, seventy two. How many elders? Seventy, right? But there's twelve tribes. How are you supposed to have how are you supposed to have seventy elders in twelve tribes? If you give every tribe gets gets six, what's going to end up happening? You have extra two, right? So so Moshe Rabbeinu says everyone gets six people of their tribe. Six elders can be chosen by tribe, and we're going to put papers out. And everyone, can, everyone, one of these seventy-two people gets a, seventy-two people gets a paper, and two of the papers are going to say nothing. All the other seventy papers are going to say chosen or elder. You're one of the elders. So what, what ends up happening? There's two guys, Eldad and Medad, and Eldad and Medad they were chosen, but they didn't come out to be part of the group. Why did they come, come to be part of the group? So it says in the Torah they were baksuvim. What they were baksuvim? They didn't come out. What's baksuvim mean? Baksuvim means they were on the list, but they were thinking the other two guys who were not on the list. They're going to be so embarrassed that they weren't on the list. Everyone else is on the list. We're not on the list, and then they're not in the list. We're the only ones that God didn't want. So therefore, they stayed in their own um, tents. They didn't go back. Then they, they, the camp they didn't go to the tent of meeting to, to the Mishkan to join everybody else because they didn't want to embarrass everyone else. The other two guys. So Yeshua, here's what they're saying. What are they saying? Moshe is going to pass away, and there'll be a new leader taking them to Eretz Yisrael. Yeshua. So Yeshua says to Moshe, "Lock him up. Lock him up. These guys are. Look what they're saying. What does Moshe respond?" I wish everyone would be like this. Wow, they have divine inspiration. I wish everyone would be like this. What's going, what's going on here? What's Yeshua saying? What's Moshe saying? What, what's, what's going on? The rabbi of um, Eda Haredes in um, Yerushalayim, the Eda Haredes, Rabbi Tubio Weiss, all the shalom, he used to live in Belgium. And he was close with Rabbi Salvatitsky, the Rabbi in Belgium. And uh, after Gimel Tamos, he went over to Rabbi Salvatitsky to speak to him. He said to him, he said to him you know, you guys need to have a new rabbi. Chabad is just going to fall apart without a new Rebbe. It's all, the Rebbe is holding it all together. Without the Rebbe, you have to, you have to get together and choose a new Rebbe. Rabbi Sartitsky didn't have much to say to him. Like, it's, it's not going to happen. Rabbi Yol Khan visited Belgium a few years later. He said the same thing, call Rabbi Yol Khan. Tell Rabbi Yol Khan, you know, you have to, you should be the new Rebbe. <laughs> Rabbi Yol laughed at him like, that the Rebbe is the Rebbe. <laughs> Anyways, so... After Rabbi Weiss's grandson passed away, he, he, tragically, one of his, he moved to Israel. He became the head of the Eid Haredes in Yerushalayim. When his grandson passed away, he came to, back to Belgium to Menachem Avel to comfort his son. And he called over, a lot of people came to, 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 to Yudich Mavelim. He called over, Rabbi Salvatit, I want to speak to you. He, go, he goes in the kitchen. He says, I want you, I want to give you my name, my mother's name. I want you to go to the Ohel. I want you to ask the Rabbi to ask for forgiveness. I've been forgiven. I said, what do you mean? He said, I thought that after the Motamalus, there's no way Chabad can continue. And I didn't realize, I didn't realize the power of the Rebbe. I didn't realize what it is. What is it? What is it? What is that? What, what, is it? what, what, what didn't he know? What, and what does that have to do with this conversation about Yeshua and Moshe? Before Moshe anointed Yeshua, the Torah says, Hashem told Moshe, Give, put your hands on Yeshua and give him your glory to Yeshua. Give him, put your hands on him and you give your, put your glory upon him. And the Talmud explains there's two things Hashem was telling Moshe Rabbi. Give him leadership, give him your glory, and give him prophecy. There's two kinds of characteristics Moshe Rabbeinu has. He is a prophet and he is a leader. And the Talmud says there's two things in how Moshe gave to Yeshua. He gave him like a candle to a candle, and he also gave him from a vessel to a vessel. In leadership, you, you need to have only one leader in every generation. Moshe is a leader in the generation, and when he gives that leadership to Yeshua, he stops being the leader. He's giving away something from the oil that he's now lost. But in inspiration, in divine prophecy, that's like a lighting a candle from another candle, and the first candle isn't missing anything. In a in the relationship of parents to children or, or teacher to students, there's two parts of the relationship. There is the fact that the teacher is is in charge and he has the power to control, and then there is the inspiration of the parent supposed to give the child or the teacher supposed to give the student. And often parents are lazy, but and they they use their their uh, coercion to get the student to do what they want to do. 
but uh, their children do what they want to do, and they don't fulfill their role as parents. What their main role of a parent is is to in, is not to force. The reason why you're, a, a parent is meant a parent is about the teacher is about inspiration, and so this is what Moshe Rabbeinu gave to Yeshua. He gave him both leadership and he gave him this ability of inspiration and divine prophecy. Eldad and Medad, it seems, were like Korach. Like Korach. Korach was against Moshe Rabbeinu's leadership. There should be, why, why are you the leader? And Eldad and Medad say, that Moshe must stop being the leader. What's the difference? The difference is, there's two, 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 two parts of leadership. There's Moshe Rabbeinu as the leader of the Jewish people, and Moshe Rabbeinu as the inspiration of the Jewish people. The inspiration of the Jewish people is something that, that doesn't stop. You, Moshe said to Yeshua, you're worried about me, about my inspiration? You, they're a continuation of me. They're following, they're, they're like a candle being lit from another candle. They're a continuation. You're worried about my death? They're a proof that I'm not de- dying. Their inspiration is what I'm trying to do. There are a lot of people that are looking for power, and because they're looking for power, they do inspiration to get more power. But there are, there's not, and there are people which are trying to create power in order to provide inspiration. It's important to know what our role is as a parent, as a teacher, as in, as our relationship to other people. Hashem gave each of us a candle, and a candle is meant to be something that gives light to another person, to, that, to look at another person and see them and feel them, and use Hashem gave gave us to light them up, and. Uh, and then, then you know, and when you and when you use your candle, well, what ends up happening is, is that your children pass it to their children. It goes to the next generation. Yankel passes away, and the heavenly court looks at Yankel. Yankel is not such a great guy. He's not such a great guy. And, they, and the heavenly court is like Yankel. I'm sorry. Then they see, oh, Yankel's son Shmerel gave a check for a million dollars to base Betzalel. Oh, heavenly court's like, not bad, not bad. Look at Yankel. What kind of education? Look what kind of education Yankel gave to Shmerel. Amazing. And then all of a sudden they call him back. Sorry, the check bounced. <laughs> check bounced. But I'm sending back. So you know you're inspiring your children when they're taking it to their next generation, their children. You know you're doing it right when it goes to the next generation. A, a king, when a king passes away, his influence stops. If it's based upon power, power stops. If it's based upon fire, based upon your light, based upon your inspiration, based upon your spirit, a spirit lights another spirit. So Yeshua says, what's going on? Because Yeshua thought this was about kingship, about monarchy. Yeshua said, it's not about monarchy. It continues. It continues. It doesn't stop. It doesn't stop. And that's the, uh, that's what that, the, by vice, what, what he realized after the Mount that the Rebbe's inspiration continues in each of us and all of us till the coming Mashiach, which is him tonight. L'chaim. 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 L'chaim.